So I catch you on the, uh, on the post-lunch slump. So I'm very happy it's about nine degrees in here, so you're still awake. In 1978, I won the lottery. It made me a very wealthy man. And interestingly enough, in 1974, my brother David won the exact same lottery, which equally made him a very wealthy man. It was a geographical lottery. The lottery was that I was born in Denmark into a loving, caring family who supported us, nurtured us, helped us, built us up, and pushed us out in the world with all the care we could want for it. That's wealth. That's fortune that 99.5% of the world that I visit every day does not enjoy. When Mansour was 12 years old, he fled Afghanistan and the Taliban with his five siblings and his parents. His journey took him across. He fled Afghanistan with his five siblings and his parents, he made it to Peshawar in Pakistan, from where a human trafficker was supposed to ship the entire family out together and head towards the safety, the democracy, the wealth of Denmark. On the eve of their departure, the trafficker showed up and told Mansoor, look, you're going to have to go first. I have a bus waiting outside with vacant seats on it, and I don't ship out buses with vacant seats. Don't worry about it. Your family's going to follow you in a couple of weeks, and you'll be fine. Mansoor was the oldest of the six siblings at the age of 12 and began a journey that, as far as we can reconstruct, took him about four, five months until he reached the central station in Copenhagen where he was picked up by the authorities, went into the unaccompanied minors program, and sat down and waited for his family to arrive. Needless to say almost, they never did. And when my brother David and I met Mansoor five years later, he shared this story with us. And this being the year 2005, we figured, well, how difficult can it be to find family members? In some way, we're all connected. We all know each other, we can all relate, we go to emails, we got phones, and so on and so forth. I mean, this was in the days before almost social media, but even then. We engaged with the big organizations and discovered a, uh, a lot of goodwill, a lot of good people, a lot of good hearts wanting to assist, but it seemed mostly that they could engage with us on the scope of the millions of refugees crossing international borders. When you narrowed that down to the one person in the midst of it all, and began looking for information on that one Afghan that had traveled from A to B, or that one Sudanese, or that one Colombian, the picture was different. We discovered that essentially there was no technology being involved in the refugee family tracing affairs. So information that was captured in one place, be that in Peshawar, or be that in Khartoum, stayed in these different places, not connected to a grid, not shared amongst organizations, and not shared with refugees themselves. David and I managed, um, very much by serendipity, which another gentleman spoke about earlier today, to find Mansour's one younger brother, Parwan, in the city of Stavropol in the south of Russia, where we found him stateless and more or less haunted by the local authorities and the Russians as such for being an Afghan in the wrong place at the wrong time. We managed to have him brought up to Moscow and in October 2005 reunited the two brothers, after six years of silence, six years of separation, and six years of absolute uncertainty. And the first question we heard from those two in Moscow was, do you know what happened to the rest of the family? That meeting for us as two brothers who are very close, helping two brothers who once again became very close, was epiphanous. It changed our lives and it changed the course of our lives completely as we began to realize that the story of Mansoor and Parwan was unfortunately not unique. It was just one out of millions. As we came to learn, many people are in the exact same situation across the hot spots of this world that are forgotten easily once our camera lenses shoot off to a different place. Right now it's Syria, tomorrow it's another place, but the war zones, the tragedies, the difficulties remain even if we don't see them. Coming back from this journey and realizing that this was such a massive global problem, my brother and I sat down and ran through the process and said, well look, 
two Danes with everything at our disposal compared to a refugee. Authority, language skills, the ability to question authorities, and so on and so forth found nothing. Where was the, as we mentioned back then, the Google for refugees? Where was the platform that could collect information from these different refugee camps, conflict zones, urban areas, and so on? Submitted to a platform that was shareable, that was searchable, that was traceable, that was open to every organization instead of working in silos where your work never gets shared for whichever reason I still haven't understood. Where was the system that instead of laying all the power with the organizations distributed this knowledge out to reach the refugees and make them an important part of the tracing process by capturing their information where they were. So when your two brothers who know nothing about refugees and not much about technology, what do you do? You create Refugees United, which is the exact database that we had requested for so long in this process, working to minimize the bureaucracies of the establishments, working to share information in a much faster fashion so that families don't have to go for years to never in trying to find family and instead dwindle that period of time down to perhaps months, weeks, days, and hopefully at some stage hours. We didn't want to build a traditional NGO. I don't think my brother and I are very traditional in many senses, so it's kind of natural for us to go completely opposite the rest. And we wanted to create an organization that was a hybrid between the private sector, taking the strategy, the execution, the focus on data, on measurement, on results, and then line it up with the vision, the passion, the dedication of the NGO. We knew from the start that we'd want to build an organization that sort of flipped the status quo upside down and said, we've identified a problem. We think we've identified a solution. The quest is now not to see how far you can stretch that, but how short you can make it from identifying a problem and to solving it. So we went out into the world, knocked on doors, explained our problems and said, look, this is what we need. This is what you can do for us. Are you willing to engage with Refugees United to help families find each other faster. Unfortunately for us, the idea resonated with a lot of people. The idea resonated with a lot of private corporations. And sooner, eh, sooner or later, it resonated with the organizations as well that began to see the uptake of the technology we provide to help more people in the camps. Part of our approach was to focus on innovation. It was a question of sinking in and seeing what kind of people we could address and get on our side of the team to make sure that we pushed innovative technologies that are applicable in the surroundings that we work in. So I'm proud to say that all of our funding is from the private sector. All of our partnerships, more or less, rest in the private sector. We have never received public funding Mostly because we wanted the dynamics and we wanted the aggressive strategies of the private sector. So much of our funding comes from VCs, from venture capitalists, uh, from the philanthropic arms of these different points, which enables us to really push our innovations in the sense that we test, we try, we iterate, we fail, we pick ourselves up and we learn from it, and then we try again. This wouldn't have been possible, I believe, if we'd gone the traditional structural way and gotten the funding from the various government institutions and so on because we felt we'd be too bogged down in the reporting structures, in the this and that structures, whereas in the ways that we work now, we run freely. And running free, I believe, is uh, it's important, it's necessary. I'd say it's quintessential for success when you're addressing problems that have been problems for so many years without having found the right solutions yet you got to test it, you got to push the boundaries, you got to be out there, and you got to make a difference, and you got to fail. Well, if you can avoid failing, that's pretty good, but I doubt that you can avoid failing if you're trying to create something brand new. The technologies that we found to be the, uh, the, the, the common threat in every life that we touch is, of course, mobile phones. And I'm not talking about the fancy Androids and the iPhones and the lovely gadgets that we're all sitting here with, but feature phones. 
I've sat numerous times in refugee camps with families that could barely afford to feed their kids. Families that barely had clothes on their back, but they still had that Nokia 3110. It may cost $7, and they may have only about four dirhams of credit on it, but they have it because it's a lifeline. It's access to information. It's an opportunity for people to reach out to you. It's suddenly, it's an availability of a luxury that we take for granted, but when you're speaking with a refugee that has gone through so much difficulty, who is sitting in such a remote place in the world, and with so little access to the knowledge we take for granted, that phone represents empowerment. And this is what we focused on. We focused on building our database, working throughout these different areas, and playing into the technologies that was accessible to us and to them, which is predominantly SMSs, we all understand them, and USSD. USSD may be unfamiliar to most here. USSD is basically a SMS service that's in real time where you can use it to top up your mobile credit in different third world countries and so on. A structured SMS, if you will, that you can communicate with. And we allow refugees to search, register, and reconnect with missing family members through the text messages and through USSD. It's a big piece of work. It's very difficult to, for those of you who are interested in tech, it's very difficult to get structured information through an SMS that you can actually use in a database and reconnect family members through the back end of this. But nonetheless, this is what we have pursued for quite some years by now. And I think this is now coming to the heart of Refugees United that I briefly touched upon to begin with, and that's partnerships. Everything we've done throughout the moments of Refugees United has been enabled by somebody enabling us. We have a saying, my brother and I, in, in the organization that goes that everything good that ever happened to Refugees United and to the refugees we help happened because good people opened good doors. And there are numerous people in this audience today that already from the beginning enabled Refugees United in our work. When we were but two long-haired, kind of quirky-looking guys that showed up at a door and said, we want to change the world, they didn't slam the door in our faces. They said, that's freaking cool. Come on in. Let's see what we can do. Let's connect us to the people we know, and let's see what kind of difference that can make. And it came to us, and we learned pretty early on that the power of collaboration is everything, especially when you're working to make the world a better place. When you're trying to help people that have less than you, there can be no competition. There can only be collaboration. Not always the truth in the world that I work in, which was one of the first truths that we came across, my brother and I, that actually the world of aid is fairly competitive for a lot of different reasons that we're not going to go into here, but really, again, let me stress, the power of the partnership has helped us extend our network and our footprint immensely to the degree that we couldn't have done it without, for example, Ericsson, who is sponsoring this year today. When we walked up to Ericsson in 2009, we said, look, we got a web platform. We're trying to connect people across these different conflicts. Will you help us? They invested in us, not money. We weren't looking for money. We never looked for money as such. We looked for people that had compassion. We looked for people who wanted to invest 10 minutes of their time because 10 minutes of somebody's time is worth so much more than $10. If you get a company or a person to buy into what you're doing with their hearts, to invest themselves and believe in what you're doing and become part of it. You've changed not only the situation you're trying to address, but you've also changed their perception of the people you're trying to help. And I'm willing to bet that next time an employee from Ericsson or Vodafone or Vodacom and these different agencies we work with come across a refugee, they're gonna be more open to that situation and that person. They're gonna be more understanding because suddenly they've seen the world through the eyes of the people we're trying to help. And just like we spoke a minute ago before with the camps, these people are just like you and me. They did not win the geographical lottery that I was fortunate enough to have and that you guys got. They're born in Sudan. They're born in DRC. They're born into conflict. It might as well be you. So you might as well step up for them and protect them. They deserve it. The reasons that we work so closely with the telecoms is, of course, that they, more than anyone else, understand the communications patterns of anyone, including refugees. 
And it's been difficult but incredible to work with the operators because it enables us to surgically, with precision, hit into a refugee camp with a text message campaign that goes, if you've lost track of your family members, this is how we can help you. Here's a toll-free line you can call. We can help you to register. Here is an SMS hotline. Here is a toll-free number for your USSDs where you can go ahead and register, find information, and reconnect with your loved ones. This one has a life of its own. It's quite interesting. Okay. What we, to give you a frame of reference, to give you perspective, an organization like the Kenya Red Cross that we work with now, in 2009, before the integration of our technologies to their programs, could approximately help 750 refugees a year to become registered in the process to find missing loved ones. After we began collaborating in 2010, they managed to register 33,000 in seven months. As you can understand, that's a fairly dramatic leap in efficiency. And it's not just a victory in terms of being able to help more people, it's a victory because you begin implementing technologies that are drastically needed into organizations that, uh, for a lack of a better word, are wanting for these kinds of things, but need the push to get there and the assistance we can provide. And we then take these 33,000, coupled with the 155,000 more people we're helping. We're close to helping 190,000 refugees right now in their quest to find their children, their siblings, their parents, and so on. And we churn those millions of bits of data into exactly what you're seeing in front of you now, reunifications. Not physically. I unfortunately do not possess the power to bring somebody from the Congo to Copenhagen. But this is Estelle and Patricia. Estelle, on your right. Uh, she sat in her village in DRC 16 years ago with her family, with her children. And suddenly, the all too familiar ruckus of conflict sounded through her place. Gunshots, screams, pottery being smashed. And she grabbed the hand of her two youngest children and got up and ran for the back door. And as she did, the front door was kicked in by a militia. She saw her father getting killed and she ran. And she ran with her two children by her hand and did not dare stop, because I believe if she had stopped, her knees would have buckled and she wouldn't have been able to go onwards. Not until she made it into the forest did she turn around and look and fight with herself over the urge to return and see what happened to her family. And she kept running for days, for weeks, for months, eventually for years, until she found a modicum of stability and peace in Kenya. And the years passed, and the more life settled in with her, the more the concept of what happened to my family dawned on her. And every night as she went to bed, this was her thought. Where are my other children? Where are my siblings? Where's my mother? And she'd heard about Refugees United because we pushed campaigns through radio stations that addressed the various communities across East Africa and Central Africa. Her thought was, it's too late. It's been 16 years. I'm never gonna find him. One of our young refugees, we employ a lot of refugees that work as ambassadors for our program and who are literate. And they roam the various urban locations and camps and help uh, refugees in search of family to sign up to our platform. Convinced her and said, look, Estelle, try. Just put your information in here and let's see what happens and so on and so forth and got her details, her tribe, her family, her parents' name, who she was looking for, and so on. And she sat back and hoped. And I'm very proud to tell you that no more than about 10 or 11 days passed until a, uh, a text message pinged in that would change her life forever. And it turned out that her sister, Patricia, had found her, contacted her, and could tell her 
that she was not only by herself and having found her, she was also with seven other of the family members. Turns out that both Patricia and Estelle were living in Nairobi. Had been for many years, separated by five miles. Eh, I get an incredible, what? Welcome to the world of the not so connected. We sit here and we talk about our fridges telling us what we need to eat, what we've forgotten to buy. We realize that, hey, my friend just had a croissant for breakfast. And it's wonderful. And the tech world is great. It provides us so many amazing updates. I get them too. And I love it. But don't fool yourselves. The world is not as connected as you think. And especially those who live at the bottom of the bottom of the pyramid. And those who are not as connected as you think are not looking to see what their friend did last night. They're looking to see if they can find their children. And five miles to somebody disconnected might as well be 50,000 miles. It's an information obstacle that's insurmountable to many of the people we try to help. 85% are illiterate, and we need to help them cross this digital barrier. We need to help build better bridges into their worlds, connecting them to the worlds of information, of knowledge, of empowerment, to provide them with a better future, a more connected future, and a better life for their children. Thank you very much for your attention.